tonight, cord cutting. In 2014, one of my very favorite subjects, and it's a year in review special episode of Tech News Tonight. Next. This is Twit. Welcome to a very special edition of Tech News Tonight, episode 242, recorded Monday, December 8th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code TECHNIGHT at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Lane and I'm so excited about this special edition of our show because we are discussing cord cutting, one of my very favorite subjects because it's complicated and how it has changed the landscape of television and cable TV and streaming and everything ahead. And here to discuss this, I would never do this by myself, is Jason Abruzzi's from Mashable. Hey Jason. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing really well. We were talking before uh, we we started the show that this is one of these subjects that really, really interests both of us. Uh, the concept of, of cord cutting, I think most people know what that means, but really only recently. You know, if I, if I said I was a cord cutter a couple of years ago, I'd get a lot of blank stares because the idea of cutting the cord or... Uh, deciding not to pay, uh, you know, a, a large uh, a company like Comcast in order to give me a bunch of cable shows that I probably don't watch anyway. That's foreign to a lot of people, or certainly was until kind of recently. Sure, and even even the term cable cutter is somewhat of a misnomer. I don't think any of us are going completely wireless. I, I myself don't pay for a cable subscription, but I lie heavily on my, uh, you know, my cable modem to uh, you know bring the television that I do watch. So I mean. I think it's a relatively new topic, but what's interesting uh, from my experience is that of all the things that I cover, usually when I'm out and about, this is what people want to talk about. This is this is something that's impacting almost everybody on an everyday basis, uh, you know, and it's going to affect people regardless of whether they cut the cord or not. Uh, it, it's changing really the face of the entire television industry, which is, you know, a lot of money and a lot of people. Yeah, so I guess if we had to just go ahead and define cord cutting now, because I'm like you, I, I pay for internet service. And through my internet, I can grab a lot of content that I still watch on my television. Am I a cord cutter or do I need to not have a TV at all and just not be interested in, you know, uh, House of Cards or anything that I might, uh, you know, my friends might be watching? No, yeah, I, I would define a cord cutter as anybody who does not pay for, you know, a cable bundle, but still kind of, you know, um, pays for certain subscriptions to, you know, generate television content, whether that be... Hulu, Amazon Prime, uh, Netflix, anything like that. Uh, you know, it's certainly like an ecosystem, and, and as you're starting to get into it, and I think we'll talk about this, that it's not one or the other. It can be very fractured. You can be, you know, a certain type of cable, cable uh, cord cutter. For instance, I, I have Apple TV, but I know a lot of people maybe just use their Chromecast to beam directly from their computer. They're not even using kind of, you know, a new age type-ish cable box, which you would call kind of like the Apple TVs, the Rokus of the world. Mm hmm. I would say, and, and, and let me know if you agree with me here, I would say that the idea, uh, you know, when, when TiVo let you pause television, you know, and then catch up later on uh, and, and, and scroll past commercials, the whole concept of, of the DVR and watching shows on demand, again, those are terms that not that long ago did not exist. Do you think that that helped um, kind of propel people forward into saying, well, wait a second, I just refuse to pay this crazy amount of money for stuff that I just don't want to watch because I can already see how the technology is going to let me get around it. Sure. I, I mean, you know, it's it would be tough to have said during the days of, you know, Laserdisc and, and VCR that this is where we were heading. But you could kind of see even then that the modes of distribution, which is really what we're talking about when we're talking about cable cutting and things like that, the ways you could distribute content were just getting a little bit more complex. And even if you take it back all the way to the days of radio, that was, you know, the only way you could distribute content to a lot of people very quickly and very cheaply was by radio. Ever since then, we've been slowly inching toward uh, these multitudes of different distribution channels. So now, you know, I've got uh, on-demand television if I want. I've got on-demand content on the Internet. I've got on-demand content on my smartphone via the Internet. Um, so really, we're just talking about like opening up the distribution channels and making them so varied that whatever consumers want, 
uh, producers are gonna, a content producer gonna have to find a way to get it to them. Now I've got, although I don't pay for cable, I do have an over the air antenna, so I get network television, nice and crisp and HD. Then of course there's there's a lot of live television that's compelling to watch certain you know sporting events or or you know maybe at an award ceremony or that sort of thing. But in general, I feel like, hey, everybody loves the concept of on demand. Obviously, streaming options have gained quite a bit. And then if you look at Nielsen ratings, uh, so some of the latest numbers show that viewership of traditional television is dropping. Dropped almost 4% last quarter. Online video streaming, by comparison, has jumped about 60%. So things really are changing. Do you, do you think that we were all so busy and just uh, organizing our lives around uh, watching uh, appointment television all of these years and then woke up one day and said, wait a second, this is actually not the way we like to watch uh, content at all? Sure. Well, you know, those, those numbers, it's, it's, it's tough to tell. Uh, I think the first thing you have to acknowledge is that the decline of 4% is a big one for, for uh, linear television, primarily because the amount of linear television we watch and the amount of people watching it is so massive. Um, mm -hmm. The 60% jump it actually seems like a smaller increase to me because we're talking about a relatively small group of people now who are growing rapidly, as you've seen, but it's obviously, you know, if you have a smaller number that, you know, grows 60%, it's, it's not quite quite as impressive. Um, but at the same time, I think that this is a trend that now people have grown comfortable with that they, they acknowledge is not necessarily going to have to be a one or the other proposition, but that there are going to be these options out there now. And, you know, I think you just have to look at the, the deals that, you know, content companies are striking uh, to see how much they are embracing it. Uh, ESPN is rolling out its own OTT service. HBO is going to explore one now. CBS has their own, which is just easily the most, uh, you know, full and, and complete offering. Uh, if if this wasn't a trend, they wouldn't be doing those things. You, know, you mentioned how some of the, the big names, the broadcasters are, they're forced to, uh, to, 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 to offer certain on-demand services, whether they want to or not, because they understand that there's a demand there. Let's talk a little bit about Aereo. Aereo, for anybody who has not followed the breathless coverage uh, that we've given it over the last couple of years, this was a company that was, that was really trying to... Uh, to solve the issue of not being able to watch live TV in particular markets by uh, letting its users uh, access a, a variety of small antenna that were somewhere in a warehouse far away in order to uh, basically uh, rebroadcast uh, uh, network television, right? Uh, Aereo was... Uh, involved in many uh, legal battles with a lot of traditional broadcasters. At one point, CBS, I think, threatened to put everything behind a cable wall um, yeah. if Aereo was was allowed to uh, Fox, succeed. Fox as well. Fox definitely did Fox as well, yes. And the Supreme Court ruled against Aereo finally back in June, which at that time it seemed like, hmm, this doesn't bode well for the company. The company has since filed uh, in bankruptcy court, so it, it, it doesn't appear that Aereo itself can withstand uh, the, the the legal troubles. But what do you think it means as far as the future of TV and cord cutting? Because, Jason, Aereo was kind of trying to get around a little bit of a loophole uh, or, or trying to exploit a loophole, rather, and it didn't work out for them. But the concept of Aereo is not unlike what some of the broadcasters themselves are offering. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Aereo, you know, I think we'll look back at as, as a really unique startup. Uh, everybody likes to talk about disruptive startups. Aereo might have been the most disruptive startup of the last year or so. Um, it really caused a lot of people to sit up and take notice of this kind of offering, uh, what kind of demand there would be, and, you know, what it could look like if done really well. I think, you know, Aereo doesn't get enough pro um, credit for being a product that just, like, worked really well and looked good and was easy. Uh, however, you know, anytime you're going up against massive media companies with a lot of money and a, you know, big lawyers for uh, big budgets for lawyers, uh, you're going to run into trouble, and that's exactly what happened. They they took it all the way to the Supreme Court, which is pretty incredible, all things considered. Uh, you know, they were going against some of the biggest biggest media companies in the world, the most powerful with with so many interests everywhere. Um, but yeah, you know, they kind of showed CBS, they kind of showed Fox that people want this, that the technology is doable. And that, you know, if you don't start developing it now, you, you might end up on the wrong side of this trend and playing catch up in an area that may end up being very hard to play catch up in. We've got uh, uh, services like Netflix and Hulu. I 
pay for both of those. Those are got, you know, sort of my services of choice. Then you've got different boxes. You've got the Roku box. I've got one of those at home, but I never use it because pretty much all the same apps are on my Apple TV. Amazon now has gotten into streaming video as well. These are pretty big players. These are companies that we're familiar with. Netflix alone is always getting all of the headlines for accounting for a huge amount of downloaded traffic, you know, during primetime hours in the U.S. I think it's something like 30% at peak times. They can't all survive, right? It is, it's, is it just a matter of, okay, well, I'll, I will decide as maybe an Amazon Prime member that that's how I stream all of my my stuff because I'm already paying that $99 per year Amazon Prime uh, fee? Or is it really going to be a matter of who has the best original content? Because Netflix has shown quite recently that that can bring a huge amount of new subscribers to that specific service because you can't watch uh, Orange is the New Black anywhere besides Netflix. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think you're going to see as the years go by, and Amazon's been doing this too, is that original content creation, having things that nobody else can have, or at least that you control the licensing of, is really going to be paramount. As, as I said earlier, you know, kind of as distribution gets democratized, having something that streams content to you is not a der terribly difficult thing to build. Uh, that's why CBS has been building their own. Fox is building their own. Like all these companies are investing in their own infrastructure to stream this stuff because they're saying, listen, we control the content. We're, we're producing this stuff and we no longer need to rely on, on you know, Comcast, Time Warner Cable or Cablevision or whoever your supplier is uh, to get this to our customers. And down the line, like I also don't want to rely on Netflix to stream my movies. Like I can do that myself. And, you know, that, you know, you might not see that only one exists, but it also just puts a lot more power in the hands of the content providers who are saying, like, listen, I'll license this to you, but I'm not going to give you the same deal we used to because I could just do it myself now. Mm. Definitely a bandwidth issue. And we're going to talk a lot more about that after the break. The fact that big cable companies might own the pipes now, but the whole thing is changing right before our eyes. But first, let's take just a few moments to thank Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of TN2, this very special cord cutting episode. Squarespace just launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, which is a whole redesign interface that makes it easier than ever to put together a professional website that looks good and will impress people. Squarespace constantly improves their platform. In fact, they've iterated a number of times since I've been a member. Squarespace 7 has easier editing, so you can edit live on one screen. You can preview designs uh, on a variety of di different device modes means if you put together a website and you think, well, this looks really nice on my, you know, my iMac here on some big screen, let's make sure that it also looks good on a tiny little, you know, the smallest Android phone that's on the market, for example. You also have, uh, this is new, instant access to professional stock photography from Getty. Squarespace will allow direct purchases inside its platform from Getty Images, $10 a pop for your site. That really comes in handy if you just need some beautiful image that that that, that helps describe whatever you're putting together. And it, you don't have to have it on your own camera. You just go ahead and get it from Getty. You also have instant branded email setup from Google Apps. So you have branded email for your small business automatically automatically set as soon as you sign up for a Squarespace account. And then they've got a bunch of different templates that are for specific professions. It's just, it's like a cheat sheet. If you're a musician or a chef or an artist, Squarespace has designed category specific templates that cater to requirements for the industry group that you might already be a part of. Now, hey, it's easy to use. But everybody needs a little help from time to time. Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I've had really good success with them. Smart bunch over there, and they always are uh, ready and willing to help me out. There's self-help articles and video workshops as well if you prefer to browse and learn at your leisure. Plans start at just $8 per month and include free domain name if you sign up for a year and hosting is included as well. I mean, Squarespace is truly an all-in-one solution. Squarespace will take care of all the hosting and you don't have to. And you don't have to worry about your site going down either. Anything like that. Nope, nope. Squarespace does it all. You can start a free two-week trial completely free. When I say free, I really mean free. There's no like hidden credit card that you're going to have to put in there and they're not going to charge you later. You've got two weeks to build your website. You will love it. So when you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT. That's T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T. And that gives you 10% off. 
And also let Squarespace know that you love us. If you want to use Squarespace 7 and you're an existing customer, just go to the settings tab and activate all of your new features. And tell us which ones you like best. Thanks to Squarespace for their support of Tech News Tonight. Squarespace, start here and go anywhere. All right, we are here with Jason Abruzzi's from Mashable, who's graciously come onto the show. The special episode, holiday week episode of TN2. We're talking about cord cutting and the future of content and streaming and all of that good stuff. All right, so Jason, we've got uh, companies like HBO and ESPN and, and, and as you mentioned, I think CBS. They're all working with streaming options. It's not as if every... Every single thing that CBS offers now I can just get on demand doesn't work that way. But I think that the, the the big players realize that once our habits change, we will no longer bend to the way that they would prefer that we still do things, which is turn on channel five and never change the channel, you know, for four or five hours at a time. Sure. And, and you know, I think that there's there's probably are going to be a lot of consumers like that for decades to come that do, you know, consume their media like that and want to consume their media like that. And, and there's really, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But the upside is that now that we have these alternative means, you know, it doesn't have to be a one size fits all, you know, here's your TV type package. Like, you know, there could be multiple different ways, multiple different levels of consumption that you can have on any one of these products. Um, and, and I think the upside of that is it's just more choice for the consumer. No, I mean, you're not kind of pigeonholed to any option anymore. Do you think that cable networks, the, the, the traditional cable networks, uh, run a risk of, of damaging the core business that they already have with cable companies. Uh, Time Warner Cable, Comcast, Verizon. I mean, they're, that's, that's the issue, right? It's a little bit of a, well, who changes first? Um, you know, when does HBO actually give us that $10 a month HBO access that is not tied to any sort of cable subscription. I mean, it it has to be the tipping point when finally HBO says we can make more money without the cable network. What what's what's holding us back from getting there? Now, that's a sixty four billion dollar question. That that, <laughs> is, that is really the thing that everybody's trying to figure out. I mean, the smartest people in this industry are trying to figure out how do we do it in a way, and when do we do the timing to make sure that we are. Uh, you know, not taking away from our core businesses, our existing our existing money, uh, making sure that we're investing in the future early enough to, you know, get ahead of our competitors or stay competitive with them. Uh, it's a very difficult calculus, and we're watching these companies do it in real time. I don't think it was a huge coincidence that HBO announced their uh, streaming uh, service, and the next day CBS came out with theirs. I mean, it was it was kind of an incredible 48 hours, and I think a few days before that. ESPN talked about they're very limited, much more limited than the others, streaming, which will be uh, primarily NBA basketball games for now. I think they're also doing some cricket. So, you, you know, you're kind of watching it. You're kind of watching this market evolve. And um, I, I mean, like I said, these are, people are very smart, but they're not soothsayers. They're trying to figure it out just like everybody else. But uh, I think it's it's more validation that this isn't some passing fad, that they're, they're you know, acknowledging that people want to consume media like this. And that the trends are going in the right direction, that they have to they have to start offering these things. And like, as I said, the upside for consumers is just like a little more, little more, um, more options and more competition that you know hopefully helps save you money here or there. What are your thoughts on the is, uh, the uh, I guess de-emphasis de on live streaming? Now, if you are a streaming subscriber for, let's say, I, you know, I love the show Game of Thrones. Well, I know that when Game of Thrones is 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 in a current season, new episodes come out on Sunday night, and through my HBO Go app, I can get the East Coast feed. So I know kind of when my Twitter friends are going to start freaking out about the show. We're all watching at the same time, but I certainly don't have to watch it at that time. I can watch it whenever. It's all on demand. I find that it it does create a little bit of a it's there's there's less fanfare around a particular episode because we just all have the option to watch whenever. You have a lot more issues of spoiler alerts because somebody uh -huh. just didn't feel like watching a particular show for a month and then gets angry because maybe I made, you know, some sort of a comment because I didn't realize that that was how they were doing things. It does feel disjointed to me. What are your thoughts on how we get past that or do we? That's a tough one. And, and I think the, the sense of like live versus taped and, and if there's extra value and we should charge people more if they want to see it night of, uh, that to me speaks to actually a broader concept in media right now, which is like 
figuring out how to uh, make the most money out of your super fans. And this is something we're seeing in music too. You know, as the democratization of the distribution of all this stuff, just making it easier to get stuff from point A to the consumer. Um, you know, certain people certainly emerge that are willing to pay a higher premium uh, than others. And that means that, you know, we have to try to squeeze a little bit of extra money out of those super fans because they're willing to pony up the, the money. And if that means charging them for getting it, uh, you know, live or same night, if that means um, putting enhanced value on certain products. I mean, if I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan, maybe I'm paying a little bit extra for a director's cut of an episode or to hear, you know, the director's commentary, things like that. You're seeing it in the music industry in the form of uh, kind of behind the scenes looks at how, uh, uh, you know, albums are made, um, deleted versions of various tracks, things like that. So I think it can be a little fractured and it can be a little frustrating. And actually the spoiler culture is really interesting because it almost seems to perpetuate the live thing. Like, you know, <laughs> I make sure I watch Game of Thrones now because I'm too worried about the next day that somebody's going to ruin it for me. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it, before this uh, episode started, I was also, we, we were talking a little bit about our habits and, and, and you had mentioned, yeah, I mean, you just don't, you just don't come in and, and turn on the TV and, 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 and figure out what you're going to watch. It's all about deciding, hmm, well, okay, if I want to watch this particular show that comes from the BBC, this is the cable box that I might use, or, oh, yeah, I could get it through Roku you know, on Hulu. It requires a little bit more effort just to, just to get to a, a place where you, you, you're watching the content that you want to watch to the point where sometimes I realize hours have gone by and I've just never started watching anything because I got my computer or whatever. Sometimes TV feels like an afterthought to me, and I never thought I would say that. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is get, get, it's going to get anecdotal. I can only speak for myself. And, and I still think that there is going to be a lot of people who enjoy that experience of sitting down and having the programming presented to them, just kind of like, here's what's on. But I've noticed that, you know, ever since that I've cut the cores, I'd say a couple years ago, um, my, my media consumption habits have changed pretty drastically in the sense that, you know, yeah, I can't come home and just find the, the you know, whatever How I Met Your Mother rerun is on and veg out in front of it. It takes <laughs> a little bit more effort to, to find something that's on that I, I'd probably want to watch. And, and the upside of that is that I actually think my media consumption habits have improved. Um, I, I think more broadly, like it definitely Improved to because it. there's a little bit of, know, feel... enough of a barrier to entry that you're not going to watch as much garbage. Yeah, and it takes just a little bit more forethought to be like, what am I going to watch now? And maybe it is a How I Met Your re Mother rerun, but that's because I made the uh, the choice to go find it and seek it out because it was good. You know, it wasn't just on. Now, when we talk about streaming, and and I mentioned bandwidth before the break, we've got uh, a variety of internet service providers in, in my area of town where I live in San Francisco, for example. It's Comcast. It's Comcast or it's nothing. That's that's my ISP, and that's just the way that it goes. You've got Google and AT&T, though, both building out fiber networks in certain cities. Google got a lot of attention for opening up to Kansas City and has uh, and has offered fiber to other cities since then which is screaming fast compared to what a lot of people have, have gotten very used to. And that starts to ask the question of, okay, well, is, as, as we all want to consume more and more, uh, you know, uh, data-intensive video on a variety of networks from a variety of sources, how do you see the landscape shaking out? I mean, what does a company like Comcast do? Do they, do they have to bring prices down? Do they have to figure out how to build something that Google's building? Or is this the next generation of who's actually going to control uh, these networks? It's a pressing question right now. And, you know, that's kind of really what the net neutrality debate's fo debate is focusing on. Um, you know, I think that certain things have become to an agreement on, which is like don't block websites that are, you know, perfectly fine. Um, but as far as like, you know, data, you know, uh, and how it flows over these networks, it can be very complex, especially because uh, video does strain the system so much more. Uh, we're seeing some build out of fiber from companies that's starting to help things. But, you know, really what it comes down to is, like you said, you just get Comcast at home. If you had Comcast and, you know, uh, Google and AT&T that you could choose from, mm. you probably wouldn't need to worry as much about them throttling or, or affecting your Netflix service because you can then just say, like, well, if you're not going to give me my Netflix fast enough, I'm just going to go to Google. Um, almost no, almost nobody in, in the country has that option. And, you know, there's hopes that that, that kind of investment will continue. But, uh, you know, I think that that's being very optimistic if you think it's going to get there. That's why it's the net neutrality debate is very important because you are kind of locked into whoever your Internet service provider is. And if you want your Netflix to work well, if you want, you know, your video to stream stream smoothly or, or to be able to, you know, really have a conversation. Skype, you know, is another one that, you know, tends to take a, a lot of bandwidth on on uh, 
on the networks, uh, then you have to care about, you know, what's going on with these systems. If, uh, if, if we can go ahead and say 2014 was, a, was, a, was a, a groundbreaking year for the concept of cord cutting and, and how many of our habits have, have, have definitely changed, whether it's for the better or for worse, it's definitely changed. Where do you see us in another year? I mean, you've got Google Fiber. Google's reportedly uh, going to launch its own video service. That changes the landscape. Certainly Google is a is, is huge company, has a lot of money, very inventive. Sure. When you and I are sitting here at the end of 2015 talking about cord cutting, what do you think will be will be different? I think the market will be a little bit more mature. I don't think it's going to be drastically different, unfortunately, but I think we'll see some of the offerings starting to to, to dribble out. And I, I think that, you know, media can tend to be a very, um, you know, let me let that guy go first, see how he does, then I'm going to build off of what he does. Uh, we know that various companies are working on, like, you know, much more robust, like kind of OTT packages, which is again, kind of like bringing back the idea of the bundle. Like if I'm a cord cutter, like part of being a cord cutter is not having a bundle and being able to like pick and choose between different things. There are OTT services. I think Sony's, you know, one of the big ones or, or DirecTV, losing it now. Um, <laughs> but they are putting together like multi-channel packages that will be akin to a cable, cable uh, subscription that's supposed to be cheaper. It's supposed to be OTT. Um, you know, it, the evolution of those, I think, will be very interesting because then it won't just be, are you a cable subscriber or a cord cutter? You can be a cable subscriber. You can be kind of an OTT bundle person. You can be a complete cord cutter and just, you know, go a la carte. Um, I think at the end of 2015, we're going to see a few more options like that. That's going to make it a much more interesting and diverse landscape than this kind of like dichotomy between uh, cord cutter and, and cable subscriber right now. You know, there's some there's some talk of uh, of new startups that are that are designed to take advantage of uh, internet television stars. For example, a company called Vessel, which is uh, which is uh, 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 being headed up by the former CEO of, of of Hulu. For example, you've got your YouTube stars. Do you see? And I know a lot of executives who come from the television industry would love to see something like YouTube be a really successful 24 hour cable channel as well. You know. Do you see that happening or is the concept of, oh, if it's successful enough, enough, let's give it a TV channel or station, sort of a, a relic of yesteryear? Uh, that's a great question and, and, and it's a really tough one to answer because I think that a lot of people who had hoped that YouTube could be this almost like, con like um, or talent farm mm -hmm. where you find like the best people making four minute clips or even 20 minute clips and, and then giving them a TV show. Uh, might be in for a rude awakening that that's just not how it's going to work. That the people who are consuming that content on YouTube, the platform experience and the type of content they're creating there is kind of part of the package. And the same thing goes with like Vine stars. Like you have these stars who are just like making these great eight second little clips that people fall in love with. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate to 22 minutes uh, of, a, of a sitcom. One of my uh, favorite comedians is Mitch Hedberg. And he always joked that as a comedian, everybody's asking you to do something else. You know, can, can you act or can you write? So you never ask a cook if he can farm. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about with, with some of these YouTube stars. They're, they're, not, guaranteed, uh, they're not guaranteed movie stars. They're, they're at, you're on a different platform at a different audience. And I think that uh, as people come to understand that better, we're going to see people figuring out how to cater to that more. Jason Abruzzi reports over at Mashable and was the best darn cord cutting guest I could have possibly had on this special episode of TN2. Thanks so much for being here. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Mine too. We could talk about this all day, but hey, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll save it for the end of 2015. Uh, before you go, I'll remind folks where they can keep up with your work. Uh, I'm at Mashable. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I am on Vine, although I'm not a Vine star. So you can follow me. <laughs> Basically anywhere else uh, that you can find Jason or Bruzies. Excellent. Well, you have a year to build up your Vine following. Uh, I don't want any excuses next year. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. And that's it for this special edition of Tech News Tonight, the future of content. Cord cutters unite. We're going to get there together. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2 if you like the kind of stuff we talk about, and why wouldn't you? You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And, of course, you can watch our show, which is usually live on weekdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. We recorded the show a little bit ahead of time because uh, right now when it's airing live, uh, we're all probably eating pie and not here. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks so much for watching this episode of TN2. See you next week. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.